Okay, why don't we get started? So thank you everyone for joining uh, this next episode of Tackling the A to Z of Plastics. Uh, this evening, the topic is focusing on the economic impacts of plastic and the economic situation surrounding the production of plastic. We have a wonderful program planned tonight and some great speakers. So we're really pleased for all of you to join tonight. Um, I'll also add that uh, tonight there's a lot of presentations. There will be time for a few questions, but this program will continue on Thursday uh, where there's even more opportunity to interact with tonight's speakers and to ask questions and tell more of your own story. Um, and so uh, we're really pleased that we have such a nice showing this evening. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, turn it over briefly to Ryan, who is going to go over the uh, Zoom rules and some of the house rules for tonight. So Ryan, uh, please help us all out. All right. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming in. I'm going to talk a little bit about Zoom as we wait for a few more people to, to come on in. So if this is your first Zoom meeting, or even if it's not, I want to show you that up at the top right, there's a little button where you can switch from speaker view to gallery view. And if you click up there, then you can see everybody else who's coming on as people come in. And uh, also, as you come in, let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. That'll also let us know that you all can hear us um, and everything's you know, going good on your end. So Jim from Cleveland, welcome Jim. Lewis in Monroeville. All right, so if you're in gallery view, you can see everybody and you can wave hello, so. <laughs> and there's actually enough of us here that you can switch panels side to side. So um, we're gonna keep you muted throughout the presentation just to reduce background noise. Uh, people as they come in are, are being muted as they join to reduce background noise. And then um, if you have questions for the presenters, you can enter them into the chat. Um, if you hold on to the questions till later till the Q&A, then it'll be easier for us to find the questions. And, um, and then at, if the presenter, you know, reads one of the questions, wants to invite you to unmute and come on, then you can also talk about your question. So um, that's, uh, if you have any technical questions or need any support, then you can chat me in the chat as well. And I'll be here to help you out through any technical issues that come up. And with that, I'll uh, turn this over to BJ. Um, BJ, welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Um, good evening, and I send thanks and good mind to all who have joined us this evening, and I pray that you're all well, and you remain that way, and you're safe and in good health. I want to thank all the dedicated people who I've worked with on this webinar series. They're awesome, caring, and I'm very humbled and proud to know them. Oh, shoot. That's my son. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> little intermission. Sorry about that. He didn't know I was doing this and I don't call him back. He's in Alaska. Um, anyway, the people that I work with, they're caring and they're humble. I'm humbled and proud to know them. We've become a team in a very short period of time. So I'd like to give a shout out to the people behind the scenes. Mary Aguilera, she keeps us all moving forward. Ryan Clover, he's our tech guru. And Kelsey McNall, she keeps us organized. So tonight I come to you as an organizer with the Indigenous Environmental Network and I'm a descendant of the Seneca peoples. But tonight I'm here as a mom, a grandma, a wife, sister, auntie, and Appalachia is my home, so that's why I'm here. Um, I've been asked to remind everyone who joined us from where you are, where you stand this evening, that the lands we occupy were home to people who understood that nothing lives without something else dying, who knew that without a shadow of a doubt that their survival was completely and without question dependent on the natural cycles of the seasons and that everything provided to them was to be used carefully and we were to use everything that they took. Our ancestors of many nations and lifeways were and are not identical. Our knowledge was place-based, our histories, lessons, and faith and a power much greater than our own and in our own ways celebrated, honored, and recognized our place in creation through ceremony and our everyday practices. But one of our shared tenants 
is to walk gently on these lands. Excuse me. Take only what was needed, use all that we take, and leave a better place for those that follow. We also know that every living thing has a unique set of original instructions. Science has shown us these, our DNA, and everything on mother is alive. And again, technology and science has proven this correct. With the help of powerful microscopes, we see atoms moving in the stones and the earth below our feet. We can see it in the plants. From the tiniest of seeds, we watch as they rise above the earth and transform into the gifts we need to live well. I don't need to give you a biology lesson at all for you to visualize what I'm trying to get across here, but hopefully to those who might have lost their connections to the beauty and wonders of life, I hope this brings you back to balance. We as indigenous people who follow and live as closely as we can to our traditional ways have learned these truths from our elders and ancestors and in turn continue to ask this, this one question, what makes you think believe and act like we are exempt from natural law. For now, I'll just leave that question for everyone to think about. This installment of the A to Z plastic webinars are focused on the economics of the systems of extraction and how violently taking these elements from Mother Earth, if allowed to continue unchecked, will continue greatly to our eventual demise, human demise. In the last few weeks, we have witnessed and many of you have probably been on the streets in hopes that we can fix the social injustices, the disparities that are caused by the growing problems of economics. History teaches us that civilizations are species that grow to unstable, unsustainable numbers and consume more than they can return to these systems to maintain the balance don't survive. Their cultures, histories are lost all but a few disconnected and random artifacts that are left to false interpretation and the knowledge and knowledge is lost in the dust of ages past. Even the knowledge that was preserved and handed down from generation to generation has largely been replaced with well-crafted but false reasoning that plays to our human desires and frailties, greed, instant gratification, ego-driven desires that encourage and normalize overconsumption. And generation after generation, these steps have been measured and largely been successful. Talking about this, how everything is connected is important because in order to visualize a better path forward, we must reconceptualize and must move quickly away from capitalistic systems that harm our communities, our families, and our future. We must recognize the way Governmental infrastructure, jobs, the environment, and our communities are being negatively impacted by not only the climate crisis, deep-seated social injustices, and failures of capitalism, but also the way these impacts are exacerbated by a global pandemic. The problems created and perpetuated by colonization and capitalism cannot find, cannot find solutions in these same frames. This is why it is crucial that we work together with our indigenous, black, marginalized and underserved communities and for all of us to recognize that we together have the power that will lead us into a regenerative economy, a way of life, one we choose, what our communities need, what one community may need is not what others need. Plans and actions will be different. There's no one silver bullet, no one solution. But to do this we must reorient and reject the colonized frames that well, sometimes well-intentioned only replicate the problems we are seeking to solve. Our black relatives are faced with a crisis of police violence, brutality, and murders in their communities all across the world. By uplifting our solidarity with black communities, we are joining together in solidarity to amplify our collective power. We recognize that when we uplift these liberation movements, we are tackling the crux and root of our shared oppression colonization and capitalism grounded in patriarchy and white supremacy. And white isn't a color, it's a mindset. What I'm trying to say in a, probably too many words is that we are stronger together. Indigenous sovereignty and black liber liberation will put us on the path toward a better future in which a regenerative economy will be realized, nourished and implemented for our future generations. In closing, I'd like to thank everyone my brothers and sisters who call Appalachia, the Ohio River Valley, the Gulf Coast, and 
everywhere that injustice and exploitation of our peoples and Mother Earth who are working tirelessly to, to realize a better world, one where we all will be safe, at peace, and prospering. Our, pre our presenters this evening will help to broaden our understanding, our perspectives, and I hope they will empower you to contribute to this movement, excuse me, in your community. Our goal is to make choices that do the least amount of harm and provide countless benefits to the next seven generations. I also hope you'll join us for the conversation on Thursday evening. Thank you for your time. And now I'll pass it to Matt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, BJ. Thanks for the inspiration, the framing, setting the stage for the series and for tonight's program. Uh, thank you so much for all that you do to keep us all connected and inspired and moving forward. Tonight we have uh, two really great speakers. Um, while they're talking, if you have questions, please type your questions into the chat field um, and we will keep track of them and we'll hold questions until after each person speaks. Um, and then uh, after that, we will um, at the end have a few minutes to, to uh, talk about both speakers. Uh, and then um, anything that we don't address tonight, we'll hold for Thursday and be able to answer the questions on Thursday in a more interactive session. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. Our first speaker this evening is Patricia DeMarco. She's a friend of mine. She lives in the community where I was born and grew up. Um, she spent a 30 year career in energy and environmental policy in both private and public sector positions. She's a Rachel Carson scholar and served as executive director of the Rachel Carson Homestead Association and director of the Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham University. Uh, she holds the office of vice president of Forest Hills Borough Council and sits as secretary on the board of trustees for Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Patty who will get us kicked off as our first speaker. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matt. Will you let me share my screen? Sure. It's disabled right now. Uh, while Matt is getting the screen up, thank you so much for coming to this. We have 72, 73 people on this event from all over, from Portland, Oregon, all the way to Maryland. And I'm really pleased to see all of you as we address this really critical issue tonight. I um, am very happy to have a chance to share some ideas with you. And I wanna start with a context here. Um, can you see this? Yes, and yes. also Patricia, um, a quick announcement to everyone, this session is being recorded and okay. live streamed as well. Okay. And so just wanted to make sure everybody knew. Thank you. So you'll be able to see it afterwards. So we're gonna look this evening, we, we heard the health effects of fracking with some very informative discussions from Dr. Ketyer and others uh, at the first session. And tonight we're gonna to look at some of the economic and financial uh, issues. But to put this in context, we have to recognize that the earth is our life support system fueled by the sun and that we depend on clean water, fertile ground, the uh, Bio, biodiversity of species and fresh air in order to uh, live. We have uh, our life support system. The living earth is under stress from fossil fuel construction, uh, combustion and resource extraction, from increasing population all over the world, and from the pattern of hyperconsumption, which has been the hallmark of our culture. And we're now facing an existential series of crises that are conflating with each other, not only climate change and global pollution, especially from plastic, but also the global pandemic, which is a symptom of the disintegration of our biosystems. And we have a situation where the economy and the com computation of the gross domestic product as a metric all over the world for whether we're doing well or not has now dwarfed considerations of environmental uh, integrity and society social values. The social safety net is rent with holes. The environmental protections are under attack, especially in this administration, so that we are completely out of balance and this is not a sustainable situation. We need to restore our values in a way that is balanced so that we can maintain our living earth, which is our life support system. And we have been 
touting the land of the free and the home of the brave as the mantra of our country. But I always go back to Rachel Carson. She was so wise. And she noted that it's more comfortable to believe in pleasant things. Most of us continue today to believe that in our country, there will always be plenty. This is the dream of the average American, but it is a fallacious dream. It is a dangerous dream. Only so long as we are vigilant to cherish and safeguard our resources against waste, against over-exploitation, and against destruction, where our country continues strong and free. We put our resources into things like luxury housing when 30 million people have uh, significant physical health housing hazards in their, in, their, um, in their living conditions. The disparities in our country are, have grown larger over the last uh, 30 years. Um, since the 1980s, we have seen a widening gap between the top 1% and the middle 60% rides along the bottom here. This is not an accident. These are deliberate policies imposed when we shifted to a market-based system of governance under Reagan, and we've never really recovered from this trajectory. And it has led to a wide disparity in income potential at the uh, height of people's earning careers, the difference between men and women and between white people, black people and Hispanic people is very marked in of a lifetime when you should be at the peak of your earnings. These disparities are very distinct. So if we want to go to a different direction, we ask the question tonight, will a petrochemical hub in the, hydro, in the Ohio Valley give jobs and fortunes to our communities or will it just perpetuate disaster? We have a whole series of petrochemical facilities planned in our region because we overlay the Marcellus oil and gas shale and the Utica shale beneath it. We have a process that takes plastic out of the um, ethane that is extracted from the deep in the ground and it separates the oil and the gas and processes it into uh, materials that can be stored, either the liquid or the gas forms, and then it's taken to industrial facilities where they make the plastic pellets and fibers and resins that are used to make plastic. Some, most of them intended to be single use. So there's not just one or two facilities involved, there's a whole constellation of industrial operations that will be in, uh, can interconnected in this system. And one of the biggest problems we have is that the laws protect the polluters. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 contained a, what's called the Halliburton loophole, which removed the EPA authority to regulate hydraulic fracturing. It is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Superfund Act, several OSHA provisions requiring disclosure of chemicals. And under this administration, even the regulations that do pertain are not being enforced. Under the COVID crisis, they have suspended enforcement and you can see the number of facilities in our area that are having tremendous numbers of exemptions from environmental protections that are designed to protect the health and safety of the community and the workers. And the people who profit from this industry have been heavily weighted with um, uh, subsidies for the oil, gas, and coal industries. Here, this, is, this one is the coal and this is nuclear, this is biofuel, this little sliver is renewable. So you have a tremendous um, weight of government effort, not only there in direct subsidies, but also in, in indirect uh, subsidies of nearly $10 billion per year for the um, various kinds of tax treatments, reductions, royalties, and low cost um, operations using federal land to promulgate the use of these extractive industries. The subsidies matter. 98% of all operating coal plants are unprofitable if environmental controls are updated and enforced. And 50% of the yet to be drilled oil and gas wells are not profitable at $50 a barrel oil price if they don't have tax preferences. These industries are not inherently robust. They have been supported by federal tax dollars, our dollars, since the 1800s. Now, there was a major study put out by the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis that came out earlier this year, uh, in June of this year. And there are six 
economic and financial risks that they revealed about the um, oil and gas fracking industry. First of all, the price risk. Revenue from the sale of the plastic will be substantially lower than the forecasts when these um, industries were going forward. Their planned uh, price was a dollar a pound for the plastic product, and now it is forecast to be 40 to 60 cents per pound. So that it is not expecting to be robust in the form of um, product um, return from the operations that were planned. Second, there is an oversupply. The uh, boom in uh, gas production has followed a federal policy of uh, encouraging gas production for export and for other um, uses. The shale build out has resulted in a supply that exceeds the demand um, domestically and it has saturated even parts of the international market. And that has put a downward uh, pressure on the price. Several projects have already been canceled or deferred. Third, this is a competitive industry. Uh, Shell Petrochemical, for example, is a new entrant into a market that is uh, really filled with behemoths of the industry, Dow, um, BASF, Matsui, ExxonMobil. These have all been in the plastic production business for years and years. They have client bases that they're not going to give up easily. And this is making it difficult for a new entrant in this kind of a market to be successful. Also, the low cost feedstock that they depend on is not really uh, guaranteed. Uh, the shale gas and ethane producers are facing bankruptcies and financial stress. They're heavily burdened by debt, even as they expand production, hoping to get out of their debt by having more product produced. The ethane that comes from shale gas, the wet part of the ethane gas, cannot compete in today's market with the naphtha-based plastics that are made from lower cost oil. So they are also losing that low cost feedstock advantage because their product has a lower priced uh, competitor in the market. Also, there is an expectation of slower growth in the economy. Plastic consumption is tied pretty much to that famous gross domestic product figure. They do well when the GDP is rising at 2.4% or higher. And the industry assumed that growth in plastics demand at 3% to 4% per year would continue forward. But post the virus pandemic, our gross domestic product is expected to be 2% or lower for a protracted period of time, at least several years. And even if the GDP recovers soon, the plastic market is not likely to rebound as quickly. Another thing I'd like to note to you is that many of these petrochemical facilities are from national corporations that are not within the United States. The Thailand and South Korea industrial um, operations are building the Belmont, Ohio, Belmont County uh, facility uh, targeted for Ohio. And this is, um, a way that money leaves our region, leaves our local economies, and benefits multinational corporations, a lot of that money goes overseas. The number of people who are working in these areas is a small part of the total cost and a small part of the total subsidies that these industries are taking. Also, the sixth major risk is that recycling is becoming more prominent. The single-use plastic bans is becoming a global movement. The European Union, China, India, the Philippines, Thailand, Canada, the Republic of Cyprus, seven uh, Caribbean countries have banned single-use plastic in one form or another. And the movement is growing as the awareness, especially of the damage to the oceans and the damage to our local food supplies is becoming better known. Why isn't the US in this movement as well? Locally, in cities, in some states, the movement is growing and there's a surge in awareness and a demand for recycling as well as bans on single-use plastic all over the country. It will be likely also that the interest in recycling and recapture will further depress the demand for virgin plastic made from ethane. Um, there is a bigger demand for plastic that is recovered from existing uses, and that will depress the demand further for virgin plastic made in things like the cracker plant. 
So we are facing now a time to choose how we want to have our future go forward in the next 10,000 years. Do we want to have big industrial petrochemical facilities with minimum kinds of benefits to our local communities and many health and environmental harms associated? Or do we want to look at the plethora of options from green chemistry, from renewable energy, from local production that we can enjoy and produce by investing in our own communities closer to home? We need to look at the effects of this proposed Marcellus build out. It has a, a lot of wide effects beyond just the local community where they live in terms of um, water effect and uh, the wastes that have to be absorbed, the sand and the total amount of material that has to be used. We have the problem of introducing contamination into our world is a question of moral responsibility. This is not a technology problem. We have a responsibility not only to our generation, but to those of the future. Rachel Carson's words were very prophetic about looking ahead and looking forward and not evaluating effects just from their immediate uh, impact on a local time. It is a moral imperative, uh, as the Poor People's Campaign has called for a moral resurgence and a moral regeneration. We use plastic, which is a material designed to last forever for products that are designed to be have a useful life of minutes. And the future of all life now depends on the kinds of decisions we make about going forward. We need to think about what we really need in our communities and what we really want to have as a future for our children and for ourselves. We have to replace the fear of change that comes when people see their way of life threatened with a plan for a sustainable economy. And that plan not only has to have a just transition of the workforce, it has to create decent work and quality jobs. These are available in the green economy. They are good jobs, they pay well, they take many of the same skills and apply them in things that do not cause us to be de destroying our land and destroying our life support. The laws of nature are not negotiable. Climate change will happen as a consequence of human actions, and our laws must change to enable and promote a green economy instead of protecting fossil industries. We cannot go back to the old normal. We need to go to a new normal that will allow us to meet the goals that we have to meet if our civilization is to su survive. Um, the United Nations Environment Program Executive Director um, made a comment after the last um, COPE uh, Congress of the, um, par of the parties at uh, Copenhagen, he said, American policy is looking backward to a world that no longer exists. We have to visualize the world that we want to see and that we want to bring into existence and not go back to the ways that have got us into the troubles we're facing now. The pathways forward are well known and the technology is in hand. Renewable energy systems that conserve and restore resources regenerative agriculture for non-toxic food system that captures carbon into the fertile ground, and a pollution prevention and circular economy for materials designed for reuse from benign feedstocks. These all also contribute to carbon emission reductions, and they give us a more viable way of life. We built a net zero energy borough building in my borough, of Forest Hills. We uh, had a le an electric bill in December of a negative $2,581 because we had made in the course of the year that much more energy than the building used. And we got all the way through to March on that credit balance. And in March, we started making more than we used again. So this does not require rocket science. We didn't have to do anything dramatic to do this. These are the jobs of the future. This is the way forward. We can reset normal in harmony with nature. People don't need enormous cars, they need respect. They don't need a closet full of clothes, they need to feel attractive, they need excitement, variety, and a sense of feeling um, wanted. They need community, challenge, acknowledgement, love, and joy. To try to fill these needs with materials things is not possible. It just creates an appetite for false solutions. So we need to look at a much better future, a better way forward, and find a 
find the solutions that our own communities know exist and are willing to reinvest in our own, have the confidence of our own knowledge of what will, what will work for us. I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Patty. Round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes for Q&A okay. and I wanna thank, sorry, go ahead, Patty. I wanna take my, my screen off. How do I do that? Uh, uh, you just uh, do stop sharing. Ah, okay. There, now I can see you again. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, we have uh, time, 10 minutes for questions. So thanks for folks who are typing in their questions in the, the, the chat field. Um, I'm going to go through them and, and um, articulate them, uh, and then Patty's going to answer them. Um, if they go beyond 10 minutes, then um, we will save the questions for um, Thursday evening or for the end of this program if there's any time left over. Um, so the first uh, is a, a, a comment or a question um, that says, um, the economics are very interesting, but isn't the real problem demand? If people didn't want plastics, they wouldn't be manufactured. How can we convince the average consumer to not essentially buy single-use plastics? And uh, so go ahead, Patty, on that well, this is this is like blaming the victim, all right? This whole process is, you know, you can go to the store and attempt to buy things that are not wrapped in 16 layers of plastic, and you can have a lot of fun and aggravation trying to do that. Uh, things that used to come in little cardboard containers now come in clear plastic shells. Um, there has to be some legislative mandates about the use of things that are destructive to our environment and to our economy in the future. We didn't always have all of this disposable single-use plastic and we got along just fine. Um, we need to look again at the damage that this material is causing, especially the fact that it becomes incorporated into our food chain and we have a, a massive amount of endocrine disruption and other kinds of health effects that are the indirect result of having so much plastic in our immediate personal biosphere. Um, it isn't just a matter of consumer demand. You have to take a legislative intervention because the systemic change is not gonna happen if you leave it to the individual one by one by one to try to fight this behemoth of a multinational corporation structure. Thanks, Patty. Um, our next question is from Gail Murray. And the question is, will the drillers in southwestern Pennsylvania have enough business just by supplying the Shell Petro plant? Well, there's going to need to be a thousand wells per year for each petrochemical facility that is installed. And there are five planned. So that means that in our region, out of the Marcellus Shale play, the full map that I showed at the beginning, they're going to be looking at 5,000 wells per year. So just think about the impact on our communities of that level of intrusion. Um, I was attending one of the uh, shale gas conferences in the days when I still had other people paying for my registrations of $500. And I heard um, two guys from Texas talking and they said, well, in order to fully develop the Marcella shale play, you would have to have um, a well every, uh, in, a, in a grid, one mile by two miles, all over through that entire development, regardless of what's in the way. So I think we have to decide, is this the fate we want for our land, for our communities, for our states? And if the answer is yes, well then we might as well just all move out because it will be one mile by two mile grid with drills everywhere in order to fully develop the Marcella Shale play. If we have other plans for our land, for our future, for our residences, for our space, then we have to intervene and say, we want a different future than this one. This is not a benefit to the people who live here. It may be a benefit to the corporations who are not here and most of their workers are also not here. The beneficiaries are not the few people who work in these fields. Thanks, Patty. We've got about five minutes left. So next from Lois Drumheller, anyone examine and compare the cost of hemp-based consumables versus uh, virgin plastic from ethane? There is a large um, green chemistry movement that has identified many cost 
uh, effective alternatives to plastic for things that have a short use life. Uh, hemp is one of those, bamboo is another, and even algae-based materials that can be used for some kinds of films uh, that replace plastic. I think we haven't begun to explore the potential for these things, but if they are raised in uh, organic fashion and can also help to restore the land, especially reclaiming um, damaged lands. Uh, these kinds of crops can be very productive in replacing some of the things that we think we need to have on a reusable and, re re you know, turnover fast basis. I think one of the things that's important to look at is to question again, how much of this single use convenience do we really need? I mean, there are some things you don't want to have to reuse, like toilet paper, but, you know, plastic spoons, plastic forks, plastic cutlery, there are good substitutes for that. And, you know, having to wash dishes is not the end of the world, whereas having plastic in all the fish in the sea, maybe. Thanks, Patty. Um, next is uh, Hart Hagen's question. It's uh, almost straight from Michael Moore's uh, recent movie, does solar power have side effects such as mining for rare earth metals and slave labor that produces it? Don't we need to change our consumption and not just convert to, quote, renewable energy? Well, you have to look at the entire life cycle. And if you compare the amount of these materials that are in solar systems compared to the amount of damage done by extracting coal and uh, oil and gas, you have a totally different scale of impact. And also there are whole things that can be done that don't require photovoltaic on everything. Uh, the, the, it's a scale issue and it's a uh, reuse issue as well. Designing things to be reused instead of used once and thrown away applies even to solar systems. Um, many of the solar systems that are installed today are designed to have modular replacement of things as they wear out and are designed to have the elements that they're made from recaptured and reused. And this is part of the design system for um, passive design buildings as well. Thanks, Patty. This next one's likely to be the last question for this part of the program. And do you have any thoughts to share on the Break Free from Plastic Act of 2020, which I think is the same thing as the Udall bill? Yeah, I, this is a really important thing. It would include things like having a national bottle bill and the uh, states where there is a deposit on, on bottles and cans uh, have recycling levels of around 85 to 90%, even with five cent deposit. Um, if in, in states where you don't, the level of recycling and recapture is less than 1% on the total. So I think having a national bottle bill would make a very big difference in a, certainly the beverage container um, uh, reuse and recycling. But understand even that is a down cycle. Um, materials that are recaptured are not usually turned, well, glass ones are, but plastic ones are not usually turned right back into beverage containers. They're downgraded to some other kind of material. But it would make a huge difference. There is also a bill pending in Pennsylvania to have a bottle bill in Pennsylvania as well, which would help. Thank you, Patty. Um, I don't know if you have any final words to say for everyone for this portion uh, before we shift gears. You'll have time to answer a few more questions at the end, I think. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you all of you who are involved in this process. It's a long, long battle and um, we have, I think, a more hopeful outcome if we have a different administration. The prospect of taking the Senate back will let us get a number of things out of McConnell's um, graveyard in the Senate that would help this situation tremendously, including rescinding the Halliburton loophole and taking action on the several bills that will be required to implement the Green New Deal. Um, and I look forward to working with many of you as we move all of that forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Patty. Very inspiring. I agree with the need to take back our institutions so that they do the things that we want them to do rather than having everything bottled up. Um, so thanks again so much for a really excellent, informative and enjoyable presentation. So applause to you for that, Patty. Thank you so much, uh, I appreciate it.
Um, now we're going to shift gears to our next presenter tonight. We're very fortunate to have Travis London as a presenter with us. Travis has organized various causes uh, in El Salvador, India, Africa, and various other countries. He's organized in Louisiana for Medicaid expansion, higher salaries for teachers, halting and compressors, a compressor station from being too close to a neighborhood there. In 2020, Travis also appeared on Netflix alongside Diane Wilson on the show Dirty Money, a short comfort episode where Diane won the largest settlement from an individual suit in environmental history. So here to um, share his experiences with us, uh, we welcome Travis London. Thank you, Travis. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank y'all for inviting me over to uh, talk about my experiences and uh, also to collaborate with y'all. This is my very first webinar that I'm doing and, uh, and, and a guest on it, matter of fact, and uh, I'm glad y'all uh, have that experience. And I'm glad to meet Heart to Home Network again. Uh, we did a lot of stuff uh, back in, uh, last year and in the year before last, and with this Mary going to uh, help out with the Ohio River Coalition uh, campaign and stuff. So um, a lot of other familiar people on here as well too. So it's great to have these people on board, and so um, and I'm happy to be a part of the network with this, to uh, learn about the new people that's um you got on board. Um, uh, my name is Travis London. I'm from Louisiana, and if I'm talk too fast, I'm gonna try to slow it down because it's my culture. I'm Creole. Um, I'm half uh, French, half uh, and Native American, uh, indigenous, uh, and I'm also black. So um, I, sometimes I had that cruel accent. So if I talk too fast or my accent too thick, just let me know and I slow it down for y'all. Um, I can put a uh, PowerPoint up for me right quick. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. There, there you go. Okay, cool. All right. Um. The slide I got for y'all tonight is plastic crisis. You know, we also have a plastic crisis in Donaldsonville and uh, also in surrounding areas like St. James. Are y'all familiar with Louisiana and Cancer Alley? Uh, and right now, we're trying to stop a $9.1 billion plant called Formosa, the same plant I had helped put the lawsuit against in uh, Texas. We're trying to tackle that same plant in uh, St. James. So if y'all see Sharon Levine, that's the... Uh, Director for Rise for St. James. Y'all make sure to uh, follow up with her, link up with her, and try to collab with her. Miss Mary uh, from the Poor People's Campaign had collaborated with her, so I uh, applaud her for that. Heart to Home Network also shared some stuff. And uh, anybody that helped out Louis Levy Camp up in Louisiana with Miss Sherry the 14th, thank y'all so much for that also. Um, so we're gonna talk about the economics from Donaldsonville. I wanna use my time for example. Because, um, you know, it's a lot of things I see in, in uh, Donaldsonville is uh, really, really uh, re in relation to a lot of things that are going on with Ohio and uh, it's also a town that everybody can relate to. So I'm going to click on to the next slide. Um, North word that uh, I want to talk about is people that don't know about Donaldsonville. Donaldsonville have a lot of black history and it's a great, great town rich with a lot of history. Um, Noteworthy, Donaldsonville served as Louisiana state capital from January, 8, uh, January, January 1830 to January 1831. After the, war, after the war, Donaldsonville became the third largest black community in the state as more freedom men moved there to join those who settled near Union forces for safety during the war. In 1868, the city elected the first African-American mayor in the whole United States, Pierre Callis Landry, a former slave who had been educated in schools on a plantation owned by the Bringer, Bringer family. After the war, he had advanced to become an attorney and a state politician, serving in both houses of the legislature. legislature. He also became a Methodist Episcopal minister. Um, a Republican pinchback served as the 24th governor of Louisiana from a prominent African-American office holder during a recreation, the Reconstruction Era. December 9, 1872 to January 13, 1873, he was, one, he was one of the most important people of the Restoration Era. I mean, you mean, I mean sorry, the Reconstruction Era. Um, you can see from there that Donaldson got a lot of history 
um, the Homer Nation that's uh, located south of Donaldsonville. They was first started off in, in uh, Donaldsonville, Louisiana, but they had got pushed back by colonization all the way about like three towns down from, from the uh, original settlement. Um, also, too, they, have a, they had a lot of um, blacks that also lived amongst in the area. Uh, the black uh, community were also uh, started when the unions had let the, uh, when the, unions, the union soldiers had let the Donaldsonville um, slaves had been freed and took over the uh, community. So that would lead to having the uh, first black male of the United States. Um, oh, next slide. Sorry about that. All right, welcome to Donaldsonville. I want to show y'all everything about Donaldsonville, but I don't want to ruin anybody, you know, want to come to Louisiana and see Donaldsonville. So I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil the uh, tourism and stuff like that. So I only showed a little bit of what Donaldsonville got to offer. Um, the first picture on the left is, uh, used to be, you know, uh, some slave houses that um, black people had owned in my community. Um, the, the house um, that's right there on the right side, on the upper uh, right side, um, that house is for sale, actually. And uh, it's sad because um, the family that lived there were very, very nice and stuff. And uh, they were, had, also had a Creole background. And a lot of things that happened into town, they went um, move and they're trying to sell this house, which this house is valued to $130,000, which uh, I don't know if anybody going to buy it just because of the spot it's, it's in. And also by it being so close to the plant that I'm gonna be uh, talking about in a few. Um, at the lower on left, they have the courthouse. That used to be the capital of Louisiana. And on the in the middle of the center part of the lower part, they have the overview of the town. Very pretty, very, very a lot of green area. And um, the neighborhood real nice. People talk to you. They got grocery stores that let people um, grocery shop. Uh, even if they don't have uh, enough money on them, they even let them have credit. They even let people put flies in the um, in the window. They let people put flies in the window if they want to have like um, benefit dinners and so forth to uh, you know help people around town to afford different things. And to the lower right side is the uh, is one of the museums in Donaldsonville, and they have like a lot of AT stuff away from 1840. Uh, right now. Um, that property is valued, I think, to $234,000. And the reason why it's so low is because the foundation and everything is crumbling apart and, apart and stuff. And um, despite that, the town get grants, they, um, you know, you, you can see that they clearly don't try to, like, uh, keep up with a lot of the tourism that um, help got the money to put into town. And it don't help the surrounding area, which brings me to my next slide. Um, oh, the next slide. <laughs> uh, the real Donaldsonville. Okay. Um, one thing I don't like about Donaldsonville is if you see to the upper left. Oh, oh, yeah. Go back to the um to the previous slide. Excuse me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, from the upper left, the the thing I don't like about Donaldsonville. If you see the emblem, you'll see the courthouse on one side. And you see the, the plant on the other side when you look in the middle of the emblem. And it says, respecting our past, building our future. If you have a plant in the community that's taking up a lot of the real estate and so forth and messing up the economy, I can't see any building the future and, re and respecting the past at the same time. You know, because in that plant, a lot of, uh, of uh, people of my color is not even into the um into that plant, and not even people from my community, my, my community. Uh, also, when you look into the picture on the left, on the upper left, you see a, a, a RV camp. They have currently have a lot of RV camps that comes into the town, and they take up a lot of real estate where small businesses could be in or corporations could be in to help the job market and also to make sure that everybody could have uh, more affordable living. My body having the uh, RV camp um, located in town, um, they also raise the sales tax and they also raise the cost of living because the apartments had uh, went up 
you one time you had a affordable living where you get about two or three bedroom apartment for five hundred dollars. Now it's double that rate. It's a thousand. And the sad thing about it is that with the RV camps, you also bring in new voters. So if we want to vote in some that is good for the town, and we don't have leaders that want to do things good for the town, they got the new voters that will support the bad leaders and keep us oppressed. Um, to the upper right side, you'll see the expansion of CF industry. Uh, you could clearly see that's a very, very large plant. Right now, uh, CF Industries is the largest ammonia producing plant in the world. It was started off as a very, very small plant, and over the years, it just took over a lot of landscape, uh, took over a lot of communities, and um, they had a lot of different people that own a lot of land that had got their land taken from adverse uh, property and all other kind of penalties of, of all, um, and, uh, every other uh, penalty laws going towards property um, laws and so forth and different artisans in the town. To the lower, to the lower right, I mean, sorry, the lower left, you can see that a lot of the buildings in Donaldsonville is very, very old shape, um, not doing so well, uh, some not even utilized. And they want to sell the property for so many hundreds of thousands of dollars and nobody really want to buy it because it's not in good shape at all. These um, people that own these properties and also the ones that thriving on Railroad Avenue also is in, is in um, or sit on like council boards, sit on planning and zoning, sit in government seats and so forth. So they take up the real estate. They also take up a lot of the commerce where you can't really earn a real good living. And everything that on uh, every government assistance program, well, every government program that they own from planning and zoning to city officials, Everything is influenced by the uh, plant on uh, CF industry, which also CF industry is also now into the plastic um, business. And now to the lower right, you have like houses like this, and you probably wouldn't believe that they actually have people that stay in houses like this. They actually have grasses growing out the roof, growing out the driveway and so forth. Uh, it's a sad sight to see, and due to like uptown audiences with the historic district, this is the bad side of having a historic district when you have audiences that don't um, help out people to use the tourism money to help uh, restore houses or even help to uh, make sure that people could have different programs to help themselves to afford the things they could get to try to get their houses repaired and so forth. But you even have buildings that look just like this. So that's the real Donaldsonville and it's a tragedy that Donaldsonville is Actually, like they say in a in reflection of that picture, that Donaldsonville is dying on the vine. Um, the next slide. Hello. Oh, there you go. Um, the main problem, CF industry. It's the world's largest ammonia fertilizer plant, and now it produces plastic. The plastic plant that they have is in Oregon. And even though the plastic plant is in, in Oregon, they also uh, travel with a lot of plastics um, or devices and also with a lot of uh, plastic pollution going towards from uh, Arizona, I mean, from, or from Oregon onto Louisiana by road, by air, by water. And um, it causes a lot of pollution in town. You know, we got a price hike that, uh, in our water system. We're trying to clean our water system out. And also, I call it the cousin to Monsanto because with this ammonia fertilizer, it's also in our foods and most of our foods and stuff like that. So you never know which uh, fertilizer that a farmer used that came from CL Industries, which is very, very scary. Uh, next slide. As you can see, um, I help out with the Louisiana Economic Development Program. Uh, I try to start, you know, help upstart my business and also upstart, upstart some other people's businesses in Louisiana. And you can see that uh, we normally don't have a lot of help. You know, sometimes we got to help each other out. But you can clearly see that Louisiana Economic Development help plants out with no problem. You know, CF Industries announced that, you know, with uh, the $2.1 billion expansion in Donaldsonville. That was 2012. They, they had wanted, you know, to say that they offer new jobs. On 93 direct jobs, which is very, very low. Um, 
the uh, 349 for retained jobs, very, very low, and an estimated 68, 686 new indirect jobs, which that is very, very low. And the sad thing about it is that they were saying, oh, they're going to be having thousands of dollars, thousands of thousands of jobs available, which they're not going to have thousands of thousands of jobs available. Now, permanently, they will have a lot of temporary jobs. And sometimes a temporary job in faster than what the contract uh, estimated time is. So a lot of people get laid off and some people can't even file for unemployment due to uh, different Louisiana uh, rules. Um, the next um, part of that slide is that CF Industries seek industrial tax exemption makes proposals to Ascension Parish School Board. Uh, right now, I don't understand like, you know, it's 2020, the elementary school that's a mile away from the plant is an F rating school. Right now, some kids are even battling with eczema, which I bring in in Tulane University to do an anthropene project to where they could test the kids' skin and uh, try to link it to ammonia. And I had uh, got that idea from reading a, a Canadian uh, research on ammonia linked to eczema. Uh, the school, the elementary school is an F rating. The middle school is an F rating. And the uh, high school had barely got to a C rating. And that due to, uh, they had to transfer students to different uh, schools, you know, or they had to get them to like, uh, to do like a two year graduation uh, program. They had to get them into like a charter school and uh, even homeschooling and so forth. So you don't have like a, a, a real good number of kids that even go to that high school to even get an accurate, good grade and a good progress on the average kid in Donaldsonville, you know, and public schools are really going are going down in a downward spiral in Donaldsonville. So, I in the, in the CF industry clearly don't doesn't offer jobs, don't offer don't offer programs to get on uh, these students into the plant to do welding or any other uh, project in the plant, and they clearly don't help the school. And it said that uh, they try to make a proposal to actually uh, go to Central Parish School Board. To ask for a tax exemption. The tax exemption is, I think, is uh, fourteen point one million dollars. That would be a lot of money to relocate to help relocate the uh, current school and try to um, put it into the neighborhood where it originally was supposed to be at. So they had a um, a city council member had actually went there and um, and proposed that to see if industry to buy the elementary school out. So we could have a better elementary school in the neighborhood. And um, continue to the next slide. So the reason why the school cannot relocate back to the original spot is because the sheriff department went and bought the old school and they went turning it into oh uh, they had it near the new substation they had built and also the park that they had for the kids. Um the, the irony with this is that. The school that all uh, the, the original spot for the school would have had catered to a lot of different programs and it was big enough to uh, have a lot of different enrichment programs to help not only kids but the parents to try to help their kids with like you know extracurricular activities and also with home ec on uh, home economic on uh, programs and stuff. And it also had enough um uh, enough building to also help with other uh, government agency projects. But the sheriff had bought the uh, the school, and the excuse that he used to buy the school was saying that, oh well, we're gonna utilize the school for just in case they had a school shooting. I have been to school for the whole um, uh, I've been to school like ever since uh, 1982, and I haven't seen not uh, one school shooting. I have been out of uh, out of school for so many years, and I haven't seen one school shooting. So I don't know why they had to need a whole entire two-story school for the go and say they're going to practice just in case they have a school shooting. I think it was a lame, I think it was a, a very, very lame excuse to just uh, help the plant to not try to go and buy the school out so they could relocate it to the original spot. So that's just to show you that the, um, the police department work alongside the plant workers. And also traffic had been very, very horrible in the area. And we had a lot of depth um, because of the industrial growth and the continued traffic um, between the um, plants. Next slide. So this brings us to current. Uh, USA, this was USA Today. 
They say, where are some of the worst USA cities to live in? You will find many in the South. And we was ranked actually number two as the worst city in the United States. And some, I told some people about it in my town. They was upset, but I told them, it's real. You don't really need the statistics to see down severe being number the worst or the second worst city in the or United States. Cause we were we once was the state capital. We still are the Paris seat, and we don't have a lot of things that we supposed to have. We seventy five percent black and twenty five percent white, and we don't have a lot of things catered to the majority of the uh, citizens in Donaldsonville. So they say Donaldsonville ranks as the worst city to live in in Louisiana and the second worst in the United States. A poor city, Donaldsonville's mean annual house income, uh, household income is just uh, 22,716, yeah, 22, 22,716, very low. Additionally, a staggering 39%, uh, 39, excuse me, 39.4% 39, uh, 39 of the city residents live below the poverty line. That's horrible. The, the areas low income are likely attribute, attributable to part to a weak job market. Over the last five years, overall employment in the city declined by 4.9%. The city's 14.3% five-year unemployment rate is well more than double the comparable U.S. unemployment rate. Very, very, very horrible, as you can see. Next slide. Donaldsonville also made some other lists. Uh, Donaldsonville made number eight on this list uh, for the 2017, and it's uh, they're basing it on the census. They say the worst 10 cities in Louisiana for 2017. The crazy thing about it is Donaldsonville was the only major city on the uh, list. Everybody else were very, very, very small cities. Um, Another list they made was on Zippia.com. Donaldsonville made number nine on the list as uh, the 10 worst cities for women in Louisiana for 2020. And that's true. You can look around town. You don't see very much. You don't see too many women working in ministry of jobs. You don't see too many women involved in, um, in, in on city council board, matter of fact, let alone the mayor, or any real, uh, real leadership roles. Even in police department, you don't see, you only see like one woman uh, that have a very uh, good leadership role out of many women that are on a police force. Um, another thing that I didn't list on here, but I uh, should have listed on here was the fact that in Ascension Parish, they got more women locked up in jail than men. So it's very, very much possible and very, very much true that Donaldsonville is one of the 10 worst cities for women to live in in Louisiana. And um, to my next slide, I just want to show y'all like, even though a lot of my, my city reflects a lot of things that are going on with the plastic fight and along with uh, CF doing a lot of bad things, we also have a lot of great things going on. We have uh, things with, I was uh, telling Miss Mary uh, Aguilera about uh, the barge crisis. They had a barge crisis in the Ohio River where they, uh, the barge that sinks to below the Ohio River. We had a barge hit the Sunshine Bridge what caused the economic uh, crisis in our town because a lot of stuff couldn't get uh, imported or exported in time correctly. And a lot of businesses had uh, declined and some have actually went out of business. Uh, Miss Mary had a problem uh, with trying to put uh, the problem in a newspaper in her local newspaper. So I was like, well, I'm gonna try to, you know, collaborate and talk about when I went to Kentucky and went to Ohio and experienced things and experienced the stories and so forth, collaborate with the stories we had in our hometown. And I wrote my first uh, my first article and it was ranked number nine in my parish. And a lot of people had concerns. A lot of people went there and voiced their opinion to the governor. They went to hurry up, they went to hurry up and fix the bridge. And they also forced that barge company that hit our Sunshine Bridge to go into bankruptcy. Uh, another thing happened was uh, you can see on the left, on the right side, is that uh, with, you know, we had to try to go and vouch, vouch for the Medicaid expansion. 
a lot of times the plastic industry comes and they poison our water system, our airway, and so forth. And a lot of us can't afford the income of uh, trying to balance life and afford the medicine. Um, I was unfortunately a victim in 2017. I was uh, jogging on a levee and I had a hint of uh, ammonia came towards me and it lowered my immune system and anything that was around me that I was allergic to had made me all uh, caught an infection. So I had a fungal infection. One, one uh, medicine alone had cost me $800, a bottle of 30 pills. I had to be on them pills for a whole year, which you could imagine I was paying more, uh, with, without, without Medicaid, I would have had to pay close to $10,000 for my medicine. So thank God I had, I was eligible for the Medicaid program uh, if, because if I wasn't, I still wouldn't be here today. And they got a lot of other fights that go around the uh, United States. And I just want to let y'all know, you know, keep on collaborating with a lot of people. Keep on um, fighting. Keep on, like, talking to different people about not only just the uh, fights going on with plastic, but also with something that's going on with your personal life. Because, you know, everybody's suffering from some kind of mental crisis, going through this economic crisis, and going through the hardship with other things. So it's important to also build a lot of friendship up and not to get exhausted. Because guess what? We winning, and it got a big collaboration going around the United States. So be a part of it, and we're going to take over. God bless y'all. Thank you, Travis. That's quite uh, an impressive uh, story, a sad story, um, but a real story. And uh, thanks for sharing that with us. We have one common connection in Pittsburgh, and it is Pittsburgh is ranked very low for quality of life for African-American women. It's one of the worst cities in the United States for that statistic as well, too. So we have um, an unfortunate common statistic and also an industrial heritage as well, too. Um, so uh, with that, I want to um, start moving forward with some questions so folks can type questions in the chat field. Um, and I want to begin with a question that really was sparked by um, by uh, John Detweiler, but Patty kind of reframed it uh, in a way. Uh, and, and that is, what advice would you offer to communities facing the prospect of having a petrochemical facility in their town? What advice would you, would you give us? Um, I'm going to say it like this. One of my job titles I used to, um, I used to be was a salesman. And they tell us uh, when we get in the salesman world, we got to let people know about the product and everybody's a customer. So when you go in your community, make sure that you talk to everybody, I mean, every single person that you could talk to about the crisis, because you never know who could be on your side. Uh, if you go and Google an article I wrote called The Future Environmentalist, uh, we had created a panel in my town. We have somebody that used to be a former person of uh, uh, planning and zoning, we got two uh, former police officers that whistle blew against uh, police brutality. We have uh, also a lady that's uh, started her own nonprofit and I also um, involved with the NWACP. It has another guy that uh, he was a plant worker and him and 233 workers was affected by a plant explosion with two plant explosions and only got like $2,000 for their trouble. So right now we still going to court and um, battling um, about that all uh, crisis, and also we have a lady that's all uh, she had once once uh, she had recently won her case in real estate, and uh, we had collaborated with her to make sure that the town didn't take her property uh, from crazy audiences like adverse property and uh, adverse property laws and so forth and stuff. So each of those people that's on that panel um, was like you know different business owners and so forth. So that was a great collaboration. It was, it was one of a kind. And people never seen that, you know, they were actually had former plant workers and flaming, uh, former uh, planning and zoning commission people actually on the panel. And uh, we had a lot of expertise to back us up, you know, and uh, we didn't really need scientists or anybody to, to, um, to give us those uh, knowledge because we every, everybody has some kind of expertise to bring to the table. So in that, just make sure that you open to let, every, to let anybody in that you feel on that can help you out with the expertise part because you never know 
who can be an ally. Thanks, Travis. That's great. Um, an another question um, is, uh, where do the executives live? Do are there any CEOs or executives that live in uh, Donaldsonville, or where do they live? Um, do they ever interact with your community? I can tell you like this, uh, to be frank with you, to be honest with you, the person that run the plant, uh, they in an area known as Assumption Parish. Assumption Parish is, next, is a county next to Ascension Parish. Most of the uh, people, well, I'm gonna say like this, most of the uh, whites in the area is racist. Um, there used to be, some of them used to stay in Donsonville, and when they did the integration and stuff of all um, in, in the 1980, because we were one of the last cities to get out of to get out of segregation and stuff like that in the uh, 80s. So what happened was they did white flight. They started burning down their buildings and going to the swamp area. So uh, those people became future politicians, future business owners. They came back to Donsonville and oppressed us, but stays in Assumption Parish. So they get the other buddies to get into the uh, plant and so forth. So a lot of these people really don't come. They really, well, some of them originally from Donsonville, but they're not really part of the um, Donsonville people that try to keep things thriving into the town and so forth. And um, like I said, like the CEO, he said, right, he's, you know what I'm saying, town, he don't inter even interact with the town and people hardly even knew that he even came from the town, you know? So... You know, the other people that's in power, I don't even know where they're at, you know. Some some foreign, they stay, you know, somewhere in Japan or China or something like that, you know. But we don't know. Thanks, Travis. We got time for one more question, um, then we'll open it up just to both of you. Uh, but this is, this is one for you, Travis. And that is, this is a question about hope. So what, what gives you hope? Uh, what sort of organizing is going on in Donaldsonville to bring about change? How do you see change happening? Um, what does that whole thing look like? Uh, and, you know, what keeps you going and engaging? Well, I'm going to tell you this. Back in uh, 2009, I was, uh, I was the only uh, environmentalist that was in Donaldsonville. So I was a Lone Ranger for a whole probably, probably 10 years. And recently, I started a panel, like I say, with them expert people where we actually go in the community, we talk about the problems, and then we go there and try to fix the solution. We had a lot of success, which we started another panel where we're going to talk about those successes on, on live stream. So that's, a, that's one good thing. Another good thing is we put a lot of pressure on city officials. My town, which uh, I'm surprised they're doing, they're trying, to ask, they're trying to get me to run for mayor this year. So I am putting my name in the head for mayor this year. And we also have some of those people that friends or the people on their panel to run for office. Uh, this is the first year that uh, we're going to have four women running for city council. So that's going to help out with their rating of putting women into uh, more power positions so we don't have that uh, top 10 worst uh, place for women to stay in Louisiana because we're going to make it so that we can have opportunities for women to have just as on uh, the opportunity that male, you know, and um and so forth. So they got actually one guy that running for uh, city council and arrested four women. The first time and in, in probably in Louisiana that this ever happened before. And we challenge every seat. And another thing we're doing also too, there's a march on uh, coming up and we're trying to get some young kids involved in some young teens and stuff, and also some former college students. So we're trying to build like some kind of collaboration between those to bring in the young people, to train them, to carry on the legacy, so they could probably bring out, bring better ideas to the table, so we could have a brighter, even a brighter future in Donaldsonville. So it's like, it's a great collaboration, cause like it's very diverse, and that's a good thing to hear, cause like you know, it's not just a black movement in Donaldsonville, it's a everybody that loves Donaldsonville movement, and it's, it's very exciting. We already, you know, I want to ask like, I think I want to ask like about three people they are for sponsorship and we already raised like five thousand dollars already for the campaign we actually throwing two party campaign parties we'll be giving back to the community so a lot of people excited i hope i win and i'll probably probably be the youngest uh active i mean probably be the the youngest uh person to run for mail and win and also be the only activist that ran for such a high seat and win so we excited about that and uh, i just want to answer the other guy question 
I seen somebody say something about um, CF in, the, in relation to the plastics on um, pollution. I just want to let them know that um, they had some people in our area that actually work in a um, that work in a plant that shipped us off about the plastic pollution going into CF industry, and CF is now into the plastic um, the plastics on uh, uh, what you call it, the plastics on um, production. So they are, they are, this is the largest ammonia producing plant, and plastic is a is um is relation to the ammonia because you know you make all kind of lubricants and so forth and stuff like that. So with CF coming into the picture, they may become the top five or the top ten newest uh, producers of plastics in the world. Well, I think we all are rooting for you. We hope you win as well too. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> thanks for the inspiration there. Um, and it really is a case where every person makes a difference. The network that you've built up is extremely impressive. And um, I'm really um, moved by your story today. Um, so thank you for sharing it. Um, you we welcome. Have time. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, and Thursday, uh, if, um, you know, I know y'all say y'all gonna invite me Thursday for the, um, for the uh, next one, for the next uh, session. Uh, what I do is uh, I share pictures with y'all of a lot of the a lot of the people that made collaboration and stuff and the, the movement we're doing in Donsonville just to give y'all some inspiration and optimism and some ideas of what to do and how we uh, defeated a lot of house bills and so forth. Well, that's thanks for putting that out there. That's a great teaser for everyone who's here. So thank you so much for uh, sharing that and, and letting us know about that. Uh, we have time for one question for both speakers, and this one comes from the Facebook posting. So, um, and it's for both of you. What are some alternatives to plastic, and how can communities uh, introduce them uh, to get them uh, to get communities away from plastic? So, I don't know who would like to go first. Um, well, I'll take a look at that. Yeah. I ahead. think first. We have to look at what we need versus what we are thrust to deal with. And so the first question to ask is refuse. Can we eliminate whole categories of plastic by simply refusing to use them? Plastic bags for carrying groceries back and forth is one clear example. Straws, if you're not disabled and need one for drinking, is another. Things that are designed for one-time use to be thrown away that you can easily do something different, that's the first place. Start saying no as a consumer. And secondly, find out how the recycling system in your community actually works and recycle appropriately because some materials cannot go into certain kinds of recovery facilities and so they end up with the entire container going to landfill instead of being recycled. So know the rules and they're different in different places which is very confusing which is why some national legislation would be helpful. So recycle correctly and thirdly seek out things that are not plastic. I mean the number of toys that are plastic. If you have a child, it is really, really scary. Um, but I know that handcrafted things are valued and passed down. Um, China dolls, um, woodcrafted things, paper things, cloth things. Try to find ways to eliminate plastic that is systemically into us. And then look at things that you buy for the purpose of throwing out. The phone. How often do you need to replace your phone? Why can't we just update the chip? Why can't we just update the, the contents of our computer or the, or the software instead of have to throw away the whole thing? So begin asking those questions and demanding a look at not just automatically saying, well, that's what they sell, so that's what I have to buy. You're not a passive sheep. You can put your mind into that process and say, wait a minute, do I need this? Can I buy something that's already been used and pass it along? Um, you know, look at turning things into a circular economy instead of a raw material to trash economy. And the change that has to happen is not in materials. The change is in our demand. The change is in our society that allows an industry to say, ooh, let's see what we can invent that can be thrown away so that we make more, make more, make more. We don't need to make more. Okay, we need to find ways to make things of value that last, that become a heritage, that become things we value. 
not things that you just obtain in order to throw away as rapidly as possible. And um, I just want to say, like, it go back to like there were like I like to, I like to say a lot is always revisit history, you know, and learn from your elders, you know. Uh, I remember when I was small, we had cartoons like GI Joe and so forth and Captain Planet, and what we all they always used to say was three words: recycle, reduce, reuse. Go to that, back to that fundamentals of you of doing recycle, reduce, reuse, you know. So um, that's one way to fight to combat the plastics um, um, problem. Another thing is too, um, they got a lot, a lot of different biodegradable, um, what you call it, resources out there, a lot of new inventions and so forth. You know, go search the internet, go and like look at all these different inventors coming from Germany, from Africa, from China and so forth. They got a lot, a lot of interesting things that need to come to, the, to come to the United States. And it would be a great thing if, you know, somebody could put a website together or Facebook together and show people that, hey, um, you know, they got this coming out, that coming out. Well, you know, we don't need plastic. You know, we got this coming out from China, this coming out from Ger Germany, this coming out from Norway. So just go and research a lot of these different projects because it's a lot of things that out there that, you know, I'm still looking at and stuff and I'm still like reviewing and stuff because sooner or later, you know, plastic is going to be played out. Fossil fuels going to get played out because right now in the United States, we have a crisis to where we have in more supply than demand. They got Texas pumping, pumping oil like crazy and nowhere to store that. And you got Louisiana trying to go and try to steal property just to make storage hub, just to try to store this oil. Right now, the United States is losing in the oil trade, and China made Saudi Arabia a new partner in Iran. So Halliburton and so, and so forth lost business. So now you don't have too many people in the United States to go do the oil thing with. So it's way more supply to make to than demand. So sooner or later, it's all, it's the fossil fuel and all that going to get played out. So if I was the United States, instead of trying to go to NASA and go there and be like, hey, we're going to go to NASA and look for green men, they need to go there and support the green movement and put more money into trying to get us out of the plastic stuff. That's fantastic. I love a, a presentation that has such a wide span that involves everything from communities at home advocacy work and NASA to wrap it all up. So thank you so much that the energy is wonderful. Uh, I want to thank both of our presenters, Patty and Travis, who were truly excellent speakers, uh, speaking clearly uh, in, in, in getting uh, energy behind what they're saying, as well as uh, important facts for us to know. Um, we're kind of on a roll here. It's hard to uh, end this program but what I'm gonna encourage everyone to do is save that energy and come back on Thursday evening, uh, June 18th at 7 p.m. where we'll have more time to interact with, with both Patty and Travis. Um, questions that we weren't able to address tonight, we'll be sure to bring them. You can bring some more of your own questions. It's an opportunity to network with more people um, and people can bring their own stories uh, bring stories about how you are impacted by petrochemical infrastructure, especially from an economic perspective. So we're looking for having a nice interactive session on Thursday uh, and Patty and Travis will be back. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit more about solutions. Uh, although, you know, running for mayor is probably you know, the top of the list that anyone can put as a solution. So, you know, we'll, we'll fill in around that. Um, and um, we'll have some information about policies, bills and legislation and so on. Um, then I just wanna say one more thing. And this is something that uh, Mary, uh, who, who generously invited me to facilitate this evening, uh, she wanted me to mention is that there will be a plastic summit taking place, uh, an A to Z plastic summit taking place in the fall of 2020. And will serve in some ways as a capstone for all the topics that are being explored throughout the summer as part of this event series. 
and there'll be more information about that forthcoming. So I wanna thank all of you for joining tonight. I appreciate being the facilitator. I'll be back again on Thursday. And for closing out tonight, I'm gonna pass the mic back to BJ who has some closing words for us. And so thanks once again to Travis, Patty, uh, Mary and all the presenters. And uh, thanks BJ for, for bringing us home. Thank you, Ann. And I just gotta say that this whole presentation, the webinar before this one has been just, there really isn't any words. It's been so informative, so inspiring and empowering. And I just hope that the people that have been watching this have been listening. I've been reading some of the comments and I'm, I'm really, you know, very, um, you know, I'm inspired because a lot of people are talking about us, about how we need to re reduce our consumption. We can't keep demanding more from Mother Earth. We can't keep demanding more from our future generations. So I want to thank Matt and Travis and Patricia, Mary, Ryan, Kelsey, everyone. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone stays well, safe, and we'll see you next, we'll see you Thursday, but we hope to see you in the following webinars too. Please take care, love.